Hi, I'm Ibn Frisla, and today I'll be speaking about using electromagnetic emissions to intercept AES-128 cryptographic keys from a Raspberry Pi. So basically, as we know today, the volume of sensitive data is just exponential. Our devices are continuously just producing exponential amount of data daily, and it's just, it's our cell phones, it's our IoT devices, any device that can, can transmit it just producing data today. And however, we are trying to protect this information. We would like to have this information protected theoretically, but there's so many information out there that, that we try to protect the information. And one of these ways of protecting information is cryptographic algorithms. These cryptographic algorithms are mathematically secured. Sometimes, but when you say mathematically secured, it, it's not feasible, you can't crack it in one day, and normally if you want to break it mathematically, you need quantum computing or at least thousands of years of just breaking the algorithm itself. However, they have been shown that these algorithms are vulnerable to side channel analysis. This is basically the study where you monitor the side information of the device that actually gives a correlation between whatever's happening on the device and the, the side information. This side information can be power, EM, radiation. It can be anything that leaks off from the, the, from the device. As you can see, this is just an example of power, of power analysis where the adversary can actually has physical contact to the device and is monitoring the power waves while something is happening. Say, for example, the encryption is running. So you just monitor the power waves. And then from that, you can actually find a correlation between the encryption algorithm and the power and the power waves. However, we know that getting sometimes getting physical access to one's device could be tricky. Therefore, they moved on to electromagnetic devices or electromagnetic attacks where you can actually monitor the EM frequency from a device and you can, you won't be able, to, you don't even need physical access to the device. So you can, as you can see, this example is sitting in a different room. So someone could be sitting in that room and just intercepting all our EM information. And this is why this is more feasible than the, the conventional, conventional power, power analysis. And this is one of my favorite examples over here is, as you can see, they need a device to scan the EM waves in a pita bread. So you go to work, you see someone sitting there with their lunch. Meanwhile, it's not their lunch, they're busy stealing your information. And as you can see, this is an example of the device hiding in the pita bread and scanning and stealing information from a laptop. <laughs> so this is just basically a simple example of power analysis. This is the, the RSA implementation. So the power was captured while the RSA implementation was executed. And what we know from RSA is that they square and multiply. And then based on this, they, were, they could actually tell the difference or would actually recover the secret information just based, uh, just looking at the power traces. And then from this, they, they, what, they, what you could see is that the big power spikes over here, you can see these big ones and little ones. So the big ones is basically your multiplication and this little ones is your, your squaring. So you, from that, you can actually recover the, the, the secret key. But our talk today is we'll be focusing on the attack in the AS128. Our attack point is basically at the subroutine or the sub substitution box. What we do is we capture the EM traces from the device. The beauty of this is you, you can either use the input to the plain text or you can even use the cipher text. You don't even need to know what the key is. So you can either use the input or the output text. So what you do is you just plug your information into this lovely equation and you will get your answer. <laughs> <laughs> so basically what you need to know is that the AES has 16, 16 subkeys. So because there's 16 subkeys, you can actually attack each subkey individually. So you can just say focus on subkey 0, subkey 5. And then because we actually know what the subkey is, we can actually build our own guessing entropy or we can determine a ranking system for the subkey to determine where if the, if the equation we use can get the, the correct subkey. And then this is just an example over here of the program. As you can see that the subkey normally rises to the top or when the, the guessing entropy is 0. So from this, we can actually evaluate our results and see if we are getting the correct subkey or not. So this is our setup. What we did was we took two Raspberry Pis, a FunCube dongle. This cost us about $6. $6. So instead of buying a $300 Accor F, we just bought a $6 SDR. We connected to a, a HField Pro, which cost us about $10 as well. And as you can see, we have an attacker. The attacker is the Raspberry Pi, and the victim is another Raspberry Pi. 
What we did for the victim is we actually installed a, a fully fledged operating system. So I think Lubuntu 14.04 was running on there. So, there. so it's a fully operating system that we use daily. And what we also did was we, we limited the, the Raspberry Pi to 600 megahertz. So this is just to prevent some internal power, power saving features. And then for the attacker, we did, we, everything stayed the same. We just used the device as is. And we used basically GNU radio, all open source kits to interface with the, the FunQ dongle. As you can see, this is just our data acquisition form. As you can see here, we're targeting the 600 megahertz range because that's the base frequency of the Raspberry Pi. As, like I said before, we use GNU radio to interface with the, the SDR. So we can see the first stage to actually just pump the signal through a fast Fourier transform. And then you can see what we also did was we cut all the, the baseband from all the other sides because we just wanted to focus on the 600 megahertz. And then this is the first stage. The second step is, let's skip the slide. The second stage is to actually find the region of interest. So this is just oh, across time. So you monitor the EM frequency across time, then you execute the AES algorithm. And as you can see here, this big power spike or EM spike, that's actually where the, the AES128 encryption algorithm is executing. And the third stage of data acquisition is to actually do some denoising and removing the unwanted signal. So as you can see, that is the signal that we actually captured in the raw format. And as we apply our denoising techniques, we can see the signal becomes much smoother and readable. So one of the, the issues that we had was trigger, jet, trigger jitter and phase shift. This is because we are capturing the signals at the, at the uns, it, not at unsynchronized. So, so the signal, it, each time you capture a signal, it could, could differ from the next one. So the, there was a lot of jumps because of trigger jitter and phase shifting. And then we, this is a, the, actually our solution that we came up with. So we took the signal, we segmented it into various parts. So we take a third of the, so segmented into three parts, so a third, a third. And then from that segmented signal, we'll actually perform elastic alignment. Elastic alignment is very interesting. It's a speech recognition technique where they used to align speech recognition. So we, can, we actually apply some speech recognition techniques to align the signal. Once we do that, we then combine all three separate signals into one, and then we apply our denoising technique where we use various mathematical operations. But as you can see here, there's various options to apply. So once, it, once alignment is complete, you can either send it straight to the, the attack equation that I showed earlier, or you can apply denoising techniques or resyncing techniques, and then another elastic alignment. So this will continuously run and run until all, ex all resources are exhausted to, to determine how many subkeys has been recovered. So this is just an example of misaligned data. As you can see, the power trace, the EM traces are very similar, but they're all over the show. However, if you throw it into our alignment solution technique, that you will see that the, the traces actually become more aligned, and then this data is then sent as the input data for the equation to determine the subkeys. And th this is just our results. So. As you can see, if we apply no alignment, we send the traces as is, we actually recovered, we recovered one subkey. And this is fascinating because we didn't even apply any alignment techniques and it's telling us already that hey, in this signal, there is, there is information being leaked out, there is subkeys coming. And then remember I said earlier, we didn't apply the elastic alignment. We actually saw that from just applying some alignment techniques onto the signal, we were able to recover six subkeys. And then from that, we applied that, uh, all the other denoising and all other possible factors or also possible combinations of just recovering subkeys. And we're able to recover 12 subkeys, 12 of the 16 subkeys, just using old techniques that's been used against microcontrollers as well. So then we actually applied our new technique. So we looked at removing the frequencies. So we looked at removing the frequency between 0 to 5 kilohertz within that captured signal. And as this example of how the signal looks now. And then interestingly, the results over here, we, we recovered 12, 12, 12, sub, 12 of the 16 subkeys as well. However, in this occasion, as you can see, it's different, 12 different subkeys. But just by removing the 0 to 5 kilohertz, we were actually getting different subkeys than, than previous. Yes. So what we did next was we incremented the jump. So instead of 0 to 5, we looked at removing 5 to 10 kilohertz. And this is just an example of, the, of, our, of our signal. 
And now once we remove the 15 to 10 kilohertz, we actually, we actually were able to recover 15 of the, sub, of the 16 sub-keys. As you can see, as we perform more data analysis, removing more frequencies, we are actually able to recover more and more of the sub-keys. Eventually, we actually remove the 10 to 15 kilohertz, and this is an example of the new signal. And we were yet again able to recover another 15 of, of the 16 sub-keys. However, on this occasion, you will see that sub-key 9 was not located in... I think previously we had, yes, previously sub key 4 was not recovered. So we can see there is an overlap between removing the signals and the information that we are actually recovering. So, the, so what we did next was we just removed everything from 0 to 15 kilohertz, and we, and we will see in the next slide. So we removed 0 to 15 kilohertz, and that's our new input signal. This input signal gets sent to our equation. And then from that, this is just a comparison. So we started here on the left. That's our original single signal. And this is the new signal that we have now. So as you can see that by performing data analysis, removing signals, we are actually able to recover the entire sub-key. And this is, this is just a graph showing that as we remove the various signals, different sub-keys were obtained. And as I said before, if we remove the 0 to 15 kilohertz, we are able to recover 16 sub-keys. It's also noted that we... We didn't go above 50 kilohertz, so what the range we're looking in is between 15 and 50 kilohertz. So anything above 50 kilohertz as well was removed. So as we can see that the entire sub-key is laying in the 600 megahertz frequency, and actually we removed the signals between 0 and 15, and anything above 50, we were able to recover the full, the full encryption key. So this is just some more data analysis, as you can see. We, use, we actually just needed 50 traces or 50 acquisitions to recover the, the, the EM key. And this is very easy. You sit the day just sitting scanning someone. as the, You sit outside a company's door. Someone comes out. I'm sure that it's, it's possible for 50 times someone would come out there. Just the amount of people that walks out in and out of a company, and you just monitor the signing, the, the badge numbers, you are able to easily acquire 50 EM traces within a day. And this is why this is so interesting and, and easily deployable because you can easily capture EM signals so so easily without the user even knowing that you're capturing. And as you can see that one of the interesting stuff was that what we figured out was subkeys 2, 4, 8, and 12 was located in in all the, in all the traces. Uh, as you can see, we, used, we did an increment of 10, so we go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So this is just to show that by 30 traces, we already got 10, 10 of 16 subkeys. So depending on your acquisition or your alignment techniques, you can actually reduce the number of traces required. So as you can see, we did more analysis. We tried to determine the, the minimum value of the, of the subkeys required. As you can see, once we got by 45 subkeys, we were able to get 45 traces, we were able to get 14 of the 16 subkeys. And then we use 48 traces, we'll get 15. And like I said, we only use 50, 50 traces to get the entire subkey. So from this, we applied more, more analysis to determine why, why we need 50 traces. So what we did was we swapped the, the subsets B and C around. So subset twin, um, trace 20 and traces, traces 10 to 20 and traces 20 to 30 were swapped around. Interestingly, be before on the other graph, you could see that the figures here in red are the ones that we lost. But previously, when we kept it in, in this, from the ABC order, those subkeys were found. And however, these ones here in green are the new subkeys that we were able to recover. So it shows you that actually, if you, the data that you have, if you actually, if you actually sweep, swap it around or actually have better data, you will actually get different subkeys as well. And then what we did was we actually we kept the sub the second and third sub key, subsets the same, and then we swapped the, the the fourth and fifth one around. Interestingly, we can actually see that this is the same as our first our first result. We will, we, what we actually noticed was that the twentieth and thirtieth races it sets a base. So once the base is is set. The equation doesn't look for the, pre the keys that's already found. It looks for new keys. So as you can see, the base over there has been set. We, we found basically from 0 to, zero to 2 and then 
4 to 9. So what, that, what the equation actually does is it parks a point, it knows, okay, it has sub key 2, don't look for it anymore. So from that, you can see once the base after 30 is set, it actually looks for the, for the remaining sub keys. And then it goes back to our previous graph, which you can see over here, that once the base was set on this side, it started looking on, on that side for the traces. And then what we did was, as you can see, there's a big red dot over there. That was just the traces 30. We know we actually were trying to figure out. It found sub key 6 in 10 and 20 traces, but then it suddenly lost it. And then it recovered it again. So we did some deeper analysis. And we actually determined that in that subset, there was the data over there was just too, too misaligned. Or it was just, there was too many anomalies in that data. So what we did was we recaptured that data and we just... The beauty of this is that you can actually capture just 10 traces, swap it in with another 10 traces, swap. So this is the, the, so you can actually interchange it. So you can so as you take it out to, and you put better trace alignment in there, the traces in there, we, you are able to recover the, or the six sub key was recovered without losing it again. So we spoke about we spoke about intercepting or getting. Getting the, the A sub keys, but now we actually talked about we actually developed our own countermeasure to prevent this sub keys. What we focused on was basically some basic arithmetic, some Fibonacci, some just generating prime numbers as an as a noise demon in the background. So while you execute your AES program or your encrypted program, there's a d demon in the background just generating EM noise the whole time. And what we did was we focused on creating our demon or our demon or the AES encryption in a threaded environment. So what we, because we are running actually on a fully fledged operating system, we had access to all the other threads such as P threads, C11 threads, the TPB, and the open MP threads, thread environment. So what we, we focus on the multi-threading techniques because we eventually we want to upscale this to use on our mobile phones, on our IoT devices, because we, we, have, so, we have so many devices that has multi-threading capabilities yet we're not actually using it. We sit with the fancy phones, and how many times do we know that they're actually using all, all the cores, all the multi-threading? So we thought that this will be a perfect, perfect opportunity to actually put our, our countermeasure on our phones as well and our IoT devices where you'll just spawn up a thread executing the daemon. So this is just the, the EM signatures. As you can see, these are the, the different implement, the thread implementations. This is just, as you can see, the P threads, C11 threads, but you, over here you can see these boxes. We are still able to actually visually see the AES encryption algorithm, even though it was in a threaded environment. And if, if you know, if you can see it, you can easily, like i shown before, extract that data and then recover the sub keys. And then we then implemented our countermeasure where we will just, in, in the background, we will just create the, we will just calculate prime numbers and Fibonacci numbers. But as you can see here, in the first sequence, there was a prime number calculation, and the AES couldn't be detected. And then in the next sequence, the prime numbers was calculating, and then the AES encryption algorithm was actually detected. So we did further analysis, and we actually saw that when it was doing the low, the low prime numbers, you could actually still see the, the AES encryption. But once the prime numbers increased the amount, the, the, the calculations also had to increase, and then that actually generated more EM noise than just doing some low calculations. But... This is, as you can see, it's a hit and miss. So you don't want to say, oh, 60% of the time it will actually prevent it. So we actually moved on to a better formula where we actually replaced the prime number calculations with the secure hash algorithm. So instead of calculating prime numbers, we'll just do uh, calculate some hashes. And then the implementation we focused on was the live crypto, crypto plus plus implementations of secure hashes. This is basically just our operations or what the daemon does. So it generates, firstly, it generates a random string. We then hash that random string. We split the hash into half. It then does a coin toss depending. So it does a coin toss and then depending where the, hash, where the coin lands. So it either takes the first half of the hash or the second half of the hash. And then once you take that off, that half then gets bit flipped. And then we have, once you have that bit flipped, that flipped off and gets added to the first, to the first half that got the... Uh, got segmented, and then from that we'll just continuously do that in a loop until this basically just increases the entropy of the ashes that we produce. So one of the issues of doing this is our CPU utilizations went through the roof. <laughs> and because of that, the device actually went into a slowdown state. And then from that slowdown state, we could actually see that 
the, we could still see the AS. So, hey, we we obfuscating some hashes, some EM data, but then the device go into the slowdown state. So this was important to understand the device as well. So as you can see, this is just an example of. I don't know if you guys can see clearly that this this is the EM spectrum, and as you can see, this is the device at 100% usage. So you can actually see there's a some 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 emissions are radiating out, and that's that correlates to the AES. So what we did was we then actually replaced the the live crypto version with the open SSL version of the uh, just to, just to calculate our hashes. And what we saw was that the open SSL version was actually using 100% of the CPU. However, it didn't put the CPU or the device in that slowdown state. So it's actually doing some management where you would calculate the hashes without compromising the, the device or pushing it to the limit and actually leaking out information. As you can see here, on the left was the, basically the live crypto version and this is the open SSL version. As you can see, there's, it's a nice, there's no, in, there's no spikes in, in this version and over there in that version you can still, we'll still be able to see the spikes. So this is just another example. We can see where we put the, the, the daemon is on, so that's when we're running our new improved version and then we put it off and we can still see the AES. So this just visually shows you that you can actually see the AES when the AES implementation or the execution when the daemon is off and when the daemon is when the daemon is on, you can't actually see it. So what we what we saw was that once the daemon is actually on, we tried to perform the CPA attack, and we failed because there was there wasn't any useful information that we could extract. There wasn't we couldn't say pinpoint okay in that specific region. That's where the AES encryption is running. So we couldn't actually perform the CPA attack, and that already, so our, our countermeasure already prevents that attack. So then what we did was we performed statistical analysis or statistical attacks on this data. So one of the attacks was this chi squared test, and then so this is just the results of the, of the chi squared test. As you can see, the, that's our countermeasure. We called it the Fry's countermeasure or the freeze countermeasure. And as you can see, these are the different the different counters or different iterations we went through. That's the prime numbers, the prime numbers where we visibly we could see the, the AES encryption, and those are just when we pump the the, the counters just into a multi-threading technique. And then what this shows you that 95% or it has a 95% probability that when it's just using the multi-threading technique or the prime numbers where it was visible, there's a 95% probability that that signal still resides within the noise generator. And when this prime numbers, where you could not see the, could not actually see the AES encryption algorithm, it shows that there is a 50% chance that that signal still lies within that, with, within the countermeasure. However, if you use the our countermeasure that we introduced with the Open SSL implementation, that there's only a 1% chance that that signal could be in, hidden in the countermeasure. So as you can see, that we actually used some nice. Is some action to actually prevent the EM, the EM capturing. So the significance of this is that we developed the software countermeasure. As you know, developing the hardware countermeasures is could be shit. And as you have to, as the as the consumer, con, if he wants to upgrade or update his hardware, he has to actually come in, replace his hardware, and this could be tedious and the cost to manufacturers could be increased because they had to replace hardware. Whereas we can do a software approach, you can easily just remotely update the software or the device instead of the user just coming in. So what we hope this would do is that we would hope that this would apply to our smartphones, our IoT devices, just as we know that the age of, we in the age where we want our information secured and we know that everyone is trying to steal our information. And then this is just another approach to actually mitigate, to obfuscate the interception of, of our information through the EM spectrum. So as you can see, we just introduced a new based of attack and a new type of countermeasure where we actually use old techniques combined with new techniques to actually recover the AES encryption keys off of Raspberry Pi. As we know that these devices are well, or is currently situated in our homes right now that does our home automation. So it is very important that we secure these devices and our IoT devices. And then these, hopefully these attacks can be prevented now and in the future. Okay, thank you. <laughs> mm. 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 
Okay. We just focus on the near field just to show the concept that we are able to intercept. But there are other antennas that you can actually buy, just commercially, just buy. So the range can actually increase tremendously. So we just focus on the near field to show that the concept of stealing from the Raspberry Pi can work. But there are antennas. I'd imagine with increase of range, yeah. you know, increased noise as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, but there, there has been research out there that's proven that that's just not feasible right now as well. So what we were, we were our main point was showing that multi-threading can work, but if you're welcome to expand it and actually just the research on that format of just actually just not just spawning one, spawning maybe eight, depending how many cores or threads you have, just spawning random garbage AS as well. Sorry? Your yeah. I think you can actually run it while it's booting as well, because this is just our first iteration or, or fifth iteration, as you as you could see. But we were trying to expand it as well, so we were looking at different avenues to expand it and, as, as I said, to implement it on different devices. But that sounds like an interesting idea to start implementing it at boot time already. Thanks. <laughs> That one. that one, yeah. So if you look at the at the range, yeah. Uh, for the power levels, yeah. On the second one, you're down to uh, minus 150 dB, right? Yeah. But that's just because you knocked out the, the DC component. So why is the yeah. second one so much smaller? Yeah, because I think like as we remove the different signals, the the upper level got removed as well. So it's we had to actually zoom in because as we remove the signals, we had to actually zoom in to see where the signals were, so this is just a more zoomed in version between that, because that one starts at 150 as well, but it's just a straight line, so you can't, yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, when you, when you apply a, a high pass, yeah. you're going to take out the DC converter. Yeah. I'm assuming that's what happened. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you said you needed yeah. 15 traces. 50. Yeah. Five zero, yeah. Is that 50 traces of the same encrypted data, so same plain text? No. So it, it, can it can be different. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I said. We over here. Like over here, as I said before, we know the sub key, right? So as we can compare to our guessing entropy, because the guessing entropy will rank it. So this is, it captures all fifth. So we apply, we throw our fifty traces in there, right? And then this will become our this will this is our actual our answer. So it will spit out the entire sub key like that, and based on that. So if you take some other unknown subkey, right? So, so you can take an unknown subkey and then apply this as well. It will actually get you the correct subkey because so we just knew the, what the subkey was, but if you actually put the unknown subkey and then it will actually predict the correct so one. It's a probability based. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you talked about stretching as well, stretching for alignment. Yeah, we used elastic alignment. Uh, Yeah, basically, you can, depending on how, how how big you want to make your radius as well. Okay. And then last question: uh, A couple of years ago, I read a book called "Power Analysis Attacks: Revealing the Secrets of Smart Cards." Yeah. <laughs> where they actually talked about trademarks yeah. quite a bit on what has been done in this space. Yeah. Uh, have you checked how your approach? Uh, yeah, because our original approach. By, by those trademarks. Yeah, our original approach was to look at the smart cards. So we first basically first started on the smart cards, but we saw off the world there wasn't multi-threading support for smart cards. Then from that we moved to microcontrollers and eventually to the high, the high powered or high frequency devices as the Raspberry Pi. But yes, I, I really I read that book, so that was our first starting point was the smart cards. So no overlap between what you're doing and the, and the trademarks that have been registered. Uh, not really, because trademark is like Yeah. <laughs> Mm. 
No, 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 not really, because in our earlier work where we focus on microcontrollers first, we actually show that our, our method outperforms the existing ones as well. So we did do a comparison. So if you're interested in one, I can look up some papers that we did. We, we actually performed the test on microcontrollers to show a comparison between the existing work and our work as well. I think it was. So. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think, like, at the beginning of the year, someone did release a paper where was showing, or demonstrating that they just use the normal mobile phone to scan and intercept data as well. Which and the, is actually quite yeah. an interesting application as well, because considering the fact that it's a mobile device, and also mobile devices are possibly very easy to sneak into office spaces. Yeah. You can just, it doesn't matter about distance anymore. Exactly. Yeah. So mm. That's quite fascinating. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, you can just even write your own application because you have you can ask especially calls to the receiver and send as well. No. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Yes, yes, because these, we actually wrote it in a way that one of the options is running a daemon or the other option is actually just making calls to the, account, to the noise generator as well. So you actually can call it from your existing program as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because we were talking about, as I said, like use it on your smartphone for mobile banking and then you, you start the mobile banking app with this, and then once you're done with your banking application, you, you shut down the app. So depending on your, your power constraints, you can use it there as you feel. As, yeah. mm. Sounds about it. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> OK, thanks. <laughs> mm.